everybody. I'm going to give it a couple minutes for people to sign on. Um, the class start. I'm it's just kind of pretty quiet. I was just waiting for people to sign on because people were being a little bit slower than usual today. So, still can't get my camera world to work. I don't know what's going on with this. That's okay. Most people leave them off, so you're good. Alrighty, so I am going to finish up our lecture on learning today um, and then we'll do the review Jeopardy like we did last time and um, then you'll probably get out early uh, so that you can use this time to start studying for your exam on Wednesday. So yes, you have an exam on Wednesday. Um, just a reminder of the format, it's 30 multiple choice. 10 true false, 10 fill in the blank, uh, and then it's like a short answer ish that all is related. Um, and then you have the uh, explain it to the media questions pulled right from your quizzes. And uh, the what did I miss? Remember, this is something that we covered in class that you feel like I didn't ask enough about on the exam. So, um, you know, write about something we learned about that I didn't actually ask about on the exam. Last time people wrote about um, things we hadn't learned yet, <laughs> uh, which is great, but not quite what I was looking for. So I tried to make the directions work clear um, and you'll have extra credit like you did last time. So um, lots of opportunities for points. All right, I'm gonna stay seated just because there's not that many slides. I don't have as many videos this time. Uh, there's only one, so I won't have to do as much switching around here. Um, but let me go ahead and get our screen share going so y'all can see the PowerPoint. Um, we'll finish up the PowerPoint here. And then, like I said, we'll move over to the Jeopardy PowerPoint. All righty, so when we finish, we had just finished talking about uh, reinforcers, right? Um, and just to kind of remind you, because it was, you know, at the end of the day last Wednesday. Um, there we go. 
We had talked about things like instinctive drift, where um, innate tendencies can override, right? So you can end up kind of going back to behavior that's innate um, instead of sticking with what you've learned. And then the pre mac principle is that a preferred activity can reinforce a less preferred activity. So um, getting kids to, um, you know, be quiet or listen during class so that they can go outside for recess. All right, so now we're going to talk about punishment. So punishment is used to get a behavior to occur less often. Um, and you buy not surprisingly punishing the behavior. Um, and so again, there's positive punishment and negative punishment. So positive punishment is when you give something undesirable to make sure this behavior occurs less often. Um, and so again, an example, not necessarily a good example in terms of morals, uh, but is uh, spanking a child, right? That is quote unquote positive punishment because you're adding something they don't want. Again, it's not a moral judgment that this is a good thing. Um, and then there is a negative punishment. And negative punishment is when you take away something they want, something desirable, to make a behavior occur less often. Um, so kid gets in trouble and instead of being hit, they get like TV time taken away. So you're taking away negative, taking away, subtracting something that they like. And both will decrease the likelihood that a behavior will recur. And so some people will get negative reinforcement mixed up with punishment. Remember, reinforcement is always trying to get a behavior to occur more often. Punishment is always trying to get a behavior to occur less often. All righty. So in reinforcement, you're trying to increase a behavior. So negative reinforcement for a rat experiment might be you play in loud noise. They don't like the loud noise. It doesn't hurt them. That's just annoying. Um, and they press a lever and the loud noise stops. Right, so it's negative reinforcement. You've taken away something they don't like. Yeah, Lara, go ahead. Can you go back to the previous slide? I kind of missed the part of that. Thank you. Sorry, I just missed that last one. All right. Yeah, and just a reminder that the slides are all on Blackboard if anyone needs to go to those when you're reviewing for the exam to fill everything. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, so again, negative reinforcement. We're trying to get a behavior to occur more often. So we're trying to get the rat to press the lever. And we do that by taking away that annoying noise. Again, it's not hurting the rat. The rat just doesn't like it. Punishment would be the opposite. There's no noise and they press the lever. You don't want them to press the lever and they would get that annoying noise. Okay, so you're trying to decrease the behavior. Um, so again, punishment doesn't have to be something physical. It doesn't have to be something that harms the being, whether it's a person or an animal. It's just something they don't want or that you take away something they do want in the case of negative punishment. So here are the consequences. And I just think this chart is beautiful. I actually draw versions of this in my other classes. <laughs> so again, anytime you're trying to increase behavior, it's reinforcement. Anytime you're trying to decrease behavior, it's punishment. Anytime you're adding something to the situation, it's positive, again, Positive is adding, not positive is morally great, necessarily. Uh, and then anytime you're taking something away, negative, um, you are, again, subtracting something from the situation. So if you're increasing the behavior by adding something, 
uh, that they want, and then that's positive reinforcement. So, you know, maybe uh, you work really hard to get a bonus at work. Well, then you're gonna keep working hard so that you get another bonus. Again, negative reinforcement, you're gonna take away something they don't like, right? So taking an aspirin is negatively reinforcing because it takes away your headache. Um, so the next time you get a headache, you might take that aspirin faster. Positive punishment, you're trying to decrease the behavior. So you get something you don't want. In this case, it is a speeding ticket. Um, and that should lead you to less speeding. And then this one's supposed to say negative punishment. That is a, I'm just gonna fix that while I can. I'll put between a minute. That is a book publisher issue. Sometimes when you take slides like this pretty chart from the book publisher, they don't always have everything correct because it's often not the author who makes them. It's um, people who just sort of take their info and convert it. So they miss stuff like that sometimes. There we go. That makes a lot more sense. All right. So if you are trying to decrease behavior by taking something away, that's negative punishment. Um, so yeah, if you miss dinner because you were out too late, you're not going to stay out as late next time because you like dinner. Alrighty, so comparing operant and classical conditioning. Um, classical conditioning involves the association of two stimuli, the unconditioned and the conditioned stimulus before the response or behavior. Remember, so like Pavlov paired the food with the sound, whether it was a bell or a metronome, what have you. Um, I just realized I'm not screen sharing. Doing well, doing great guys. All right, hang on. There we go, okay. Zoom just decided it doesn't want to share my PowerPoint. So let me try one more thing. And if this doesn't work, then I'll just share a different way. There we go. He like wasn't giving me the option to share the PowerPoint. Boy. There we go. Okay, now you all can. Um, so, uh, classical conditioning happens before the response or behavior. So then you like pair the uh, stimulus with the uh, unconditioned stimulus. Yes, someone asked in the chat if there's a study guide. There's already a study guide posted on Blackboard. Before we do the Jeopardy, I'll show you all role the resources on Blackboard are again. Um, and operant conditioning, the difference with operant conditioning is that you're doing something after a response or behavior. So you are going to reinforce or punish that behavior depending on if you want it to happen more often or less often after it occurs. So classical conditioning is before it occurs, operant conditioning is after it occurs. That's the big difference, uh, an easier way to remember it. This little diagram here, I think is pretty helpful as well. So this uh, illustrates how both classical conditioning and operant conditioning could work together uh, to explain a fear of snakes. Um, so uh, you have the conditioned stimulus of a snake, we in innately as humans, as with a lot of animals, have an immediate negative reaction to a snake. Uh, this is why I don't remember, if, I don't know if you all remember a few years ago, there was a thing where you're supposed to put like a cucumber by your cat and make them jump. And it's because it was like very vaguely snake looking, right? Um, and we uh, 
cats like us have an inborn tendency to avoid snakes because they could kill them. Um, and so the unconditioned stimulus is someone saying, look out, right? And so that is going to uh, bring more terror to you. Um, you know, sometimes if someone like jumps and goes, look out, and there's nothing there, right? We're still gonna get really freaked out. Um, so those get paired for you. And so your fear behavior, whatever that is, in this case, it's apparently, <laughs> but typically you would be running away or having some sort of, you know, panic attack like symptoms. Um, that is both a um, unconditioned response and becomes a conditioned response. And then offer conditioning would be you're freaked out. And so you get comfort from somebody. It's okay. I know that was scary. Oh my gosh. Right. Um, and so then that's reinforced, that fear behavior is reinforced because you think, oh, well, when I was scared, I got this nice attention, right, from everybody. Um, and that sounds weird, but it actually does work. Then there is a third model of learning, uh, and this one's associated with Albert Bandura, and this is called social learning theory. Um, so many believe Skinner viewed conditioning as an almost mechanical process in which people were passive participants. But Bandura said that people actively seek out and process information about their environment in order to maximize favorable outcomes. So people want to get information um, to get the best outcomes they can. And one of the ways they can get this is by modeling, which is also called observational learning. And so this is when you're responding is influenced by observation of other people. Um, and these are called models, so hence modeling. Um, so example of this is little kiddos who watch uh, Power Rangers or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, whatever the sort of like Kung Fu is show of the day is, right, when they're young. Um, Following, you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s and following, uh, you know, TMNT being popular, we saw a dramatic increase in little kids karate chopping and then chucking their way through life, right? Because they had watched this on the screen. Another example is that, think about social skills. Um, you may know someone who has what you consider excellent social skills and you watch this person interact with others and you think wow they do a really good job with that um maybe i should sort of do what they do whether it's you know sitting down to a formal dinner and they know what fork to use right or it's um asking for help but they do it in such a professional and complimentary way that the person immediately is like of course i'll help you Right? And you're like, I need to learn from this person because they know what they're doing. So um, modeling involves learning by watching and imitating the behaviors of others. It's an indirect type of learning and it involves paying attention to others and their behavior, but also paying attention to the consequences of the behavior, right? If the person gets punished, you're not gonna repeat that behavior because you don't wanna get punished. But if the person gets reinforced or has no negative consequences, then you might be likely to copy that behavior. And so in particular, Bandura was interested in looking at uh, how kids learn about aggression from watching aggressive models um, and store this information in memory for later use. So this is his very famous Boa doll study. Um, and I know that the hyperlink in here doesn't work because uh, it keeps getting taken off YouTube. Um, so let me close out the PowerPoint and then I will screen share. I do have the video already pulled up. So I will screen share that for y'all. Okay. <laughs> segment you're about to see is taken from an early experiment on learning of, a, of aggressive styles of uh, behavior uh, through modeling. Uh, children uh, watched a, uh, 
a, a filmed adult uh, perform novel aggressive acts toward a uh, inflated doll, and the physical aggression was um, accompanied by uh, novel uh, hostile uh, uh, remarks. We later measured how much of this uh, modeled aggression uh, the children had learned uh, just by uh, watching. Now, the measurement uh, of uh, learning of aggression uh, uses uh, simulated targets rather than uh, live ones. Uh, for example, uh, to test how well bombardiers have uh, learned um, uh, bombing strategies, uh, you would use uh, simulated targets rather than require them to uh, bomb San Francisco or uh, New York. The uh, model pummeled a doll with a mallet Flung it in the air. Kicked it repeatedly. Threw it down and beat it. It was once widely believed that seeing others vent aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. Exposure to aggressive modeling increased attraction to guns even though it was never modeled. Guns had less appeal to children who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling. The children also picked up the novel hostile language. anyone thought little girls wouldn't be aggressive. The room contained varied play materials and children could choose to play aggressively or non-aggressively. Children devised new ways of hitting the doll. Now the object of interest was, was the novel aggressive acts, not punching the doll. And children in the control group who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling never exhibited the novel forms of aggression. And here's a creative embellishment. A doll becomes a weapon of assault. All right, so you can see the kids copied what the adults did, and then they came up with other creative ways, right, to do these things.
And if you've ever interacted with kiddos, watch them watch older kids or adults, this shouldn't surprise you, right? But it does sort of beg the question of, you know, how should how careful should we be about how kids are observing us, right? Um, and this indicates pretty careful, right? All right, so a couple of people have been asking about um, review materials. So let me show you real quick and I'll enter student view so that you all can see what you will see when you sign off. Okay, so here is your Blackboard page. As a reminder, the syllabus has an outline of everything, when it's due, when the exams are, all that good stuff. And you can always find a copy here. Um, here is where you'll turn in those uh, uh, psychology experience credits at the end of the semester. There are lots of studies posted for those now. So definitely um, get set up on so nice. Set you some instructions on how to do that last week. If I think about it, I will post those here as well. Um, here is where you can find those lecture notes. So um, for every uh, lecture, I have the PowerPoint and I also have it as a PDF. Uh, so you can just follow along this way if you want to print these out and follow them along in class, you always can, but it probably great study materials as well. Um, another way to study is that I post every class on YouTube and then share the link over here. Um, so you can rewatch the lectures and YouTube has ways you can like speed them up. Um, and obviously you can fast forward through stuff that you do have. Um, and then there is a review section. So there is a review sheet for exam two that's available here. And then after we do our Jeopardy today, I will make that available for uh, uh, studying as well. And just a reminder on Wednesday, when you go to take your exam, it will appear here. I'll make it available there um, when we get to that point. So, and then just final reminder, all your connect assignments are here. You can find them by chapter. And for Wednesday, you have the exam two quizzes due. Um, so these are great ways to study. And for some reason, the chapter four one isn't showing up. So I'll make sure that that one shows up over here. I'm going to make myself a quick note about that. So I'm glad that I did this with y'all. <laughs> but there is one for chapter four. Okay. So I will leave that after we are done here. All right. Before we dive into the Jeopardy. Does anyone have any questions about the exam or where to find materials? <laughs> yeah, I'll send an email. That's a great question. I'll send an email uh, and it should be on connect. I'm not sure why it's not showing up here, but I'll send an email as soon as the chapter four one. Uh, you have to do the quizzes. You do get points for them, but they're set up so you can take them as many times as you want. So it's a really good study thing. And also, if you're not happy with your score the first time, just take it again. You do get random questions every time you take it. No essays. It's the exact same format as last time. So 30 multiple choice, uh, 10 true false, 10 fill in the blank. Um, three where you choose one from two of the explain it to the media questions, one series of related short answers, um, and then the what did I miss, where you tell me about something that we've learned about in class that I didn't put on the exam that you wish I would. Uh, yeah, you should be able to go back and do the other quizzes as well, um, and that'll especially be helpful for you at the end of the semester. Uh, since the exam, the final is cumulative. So um, this exam is not, this exam only has chapters four, five, and six. But when we get to the very end of the semester, the final will be everything we cover to that point. Okay, any other questions? Cool. Well, I'm going to do what I did last time for the Jeopardy. Um, everybody just write down your answers for yourself 
So on a Word document or a piece of paper, um, and I'll just read the answers. It's so hard with so many of us and over Zoom to do this where you guys get points, but really the whole point is so you can study. Um, so we'll just do it that way, where I'll give you, you know, five seconds to think about it and then I'll give you the answers. Nobody shout it out, nobody write it in the chat, give everybody the chance. <laughs> All right, let me screen to here. And hopefully this time it will let me. Technology, yes, that looks promising. Okay. All right, so our categories this time around are a sense of perception, yuck, 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 yuck. the sixth sense, becoming conscious, state of mind, they'll never learn, and the good old potpourri <laughs> that they always do on Jeopardy, which is just random stuff. Um, Lara, don't raise your hand to answer because I'm just going to give everybody the answer. So you just get your own uh, enjoyment and satisfaction that you got the answer right. So yeah, we'll just do it. I show it, I give you a few seconds, and then I say the answer. So keep track for yourself. All right, and I'm just going to do each category in a row, and then there is a final Jeopardy. All right, the smallest amount by which a stimulus can be changed and the difference detected. So looking for a term here. The smallest amount by which a stimulus can be changed and the difference detected. So this is, and I'll do the thing I did before where I put the answers in the chat. This is the JND just noticeable difference or sometimes called the difference threshold. All right, a disorder where someone might taste colors. So this is synesthesia. I would never make you come up with the spelling for that on an exam. <laughs> um, so you uh, would have this in a word bank, or if you did have to spell it, I would give credit for anything that looked remotely like it. <laughs> but I'm almost positive on the current exam, you don't have to do that. All right, eye receptors that are sensitive to dim light. The answer here is rods. The cones are the ones that are sensitive to color. So know um, all the parts of the eye and also know the order that light passes through everything to go to the brain. Cells that are related to the idea of colors being in complementary pairs about the color wheel and the cells that are related to this. We talked about this in class. So these are the bipolar cells. These are the ones that combine information from multiple rods and cones. Last one for this category, the sense that keeps track of body parts relative to each other. Not one of what we typically think of as the five senses, but it is an important sense that we have. This is the kinesthetic sense. And later in the semester, we'll talk about kinesthetic intelligence, which can also be really important. Oh, I'm just gonna keep going through this way. It's gonna be easiest. So still on sensation and perception, uh, the process that makes sensory patterns meaningful in our brain.
This is perception. Pretty easy one. That's why it's a two hundred. All right, sense of smell. What is the technical term for sense of smell? This is olfaction, or you could say the olfactory sense. That would be fine too. All right. This is a theory that says we see colors because of the three types of cone receptors. So if you know your word origins, this one's pretty easy. Trichromatic theory, three colors. Oops. All right, so this is a process by which objects remain unchanging, even when sensory input changes. To make this more clear, if I were to walk around the office behind me, right, you would know it was me and that I stayed the same height, even if I was really far away, like over by my staircase over here, right? So this is called perceptual constancy. This is a way of processing that emphasizes the perceiver's expectations and memories in interpreting a, a stimulus. Expectations and memories. This is top-down processing. Remember, there's also bottom-up processing. Okay, so that was the sensation and perception chapters. So now we're going to move on to the consciousness chapter. So awareness of external events and internal sensations. This is consciousness. <laughs> uh, this one again, easy, why well, I made it a 200.1, but a good term to remember. Uh, daily be behavioral or physiological cycle. So daily cycles. These are your circadian rhythms, or if you're just talking about one type of cycle, it could just be circadian rhythm singular. A simple non-medicine treatment for seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. Light therapy. If you remember, we went over that whole study about light therapy and how it works. A nice way to treat someone, again, without having to put them on medication. The slowest type of waves in your brain <laughs> related to stage three to four sleep. These are the delta waves.
Okay, and then the Dracula hormone. This is related to drowsiness and sleep. You can buy this in pill form, or now you can even get it in gummies. This is melatonin. Alrighty. So a form of consciousness change induced by focusing on repetitive behavior and ignoring external stimulation. And here an example of repetitive behavior might be uh, deep breathing or stretching. So this is meditation. And we did a little bit of this in class the day we covered. So, Simba is doing goodness knows what behind me. So, I just hear noises. <laughs> All righty. Uh, sleep cycle, uh, where people dream the most, it's a part of the sleep cycle. This sort of ended up awkward wording. Uh, and EEG looks similar to when you were awake. So the part of the sleep cycle where you dream the most. This is REM or rapid eye movement sleep. All right, so these are a type of drug that slows down mental and physical activity. So these are the depressants, and they include things like alcohol and barbiturates. This sort of slow everything down, makes you feel more mellow, but also can make you clumsy, right? And as we talked about, if too much is in your system, then it can slow down or stop your breathing and your heart, and that's bad. This commonly used legal drug is as addictive as cocaine. This is nicotine. We most commonly think of it as being in cigarettes. It's obviously in cigars as well, chewing tobacco. Um, and then depending on what you vape, it might be in what you vape as well. I and mean, if you are vapors, people who vape, I don't, I don't know what the term for people who vape. This is a theory about dreams that says dream content reflects the dreamer's knowledge and understanding. So this is the activation synthesis theory of dreaming. This one's a bit tougher, but that's why it's the thousand dollar question. Alrighty, so now we're into the learning chapter, the chapter we just finished. So this is the name of the little boy who was classically conditioned to fear rights. This is the little kiddo that they found out later that he actually passed away of a neurological condition. This is little Albert, little Albert. Not to be confused with little Hans, who <laughs> we learned about earlier in the semester. A type of learning where you learn by watching others. This one has lots of names. <laughs> So observational learning, social learning, modeling, all of these would be correct. OK, 
Okay, so this is a type of reinforcement where someone gets paid for every 10 cases of product thing. So it's a type of reinforcement schedule, if that helps you. This is the fixed ratio schedule. You know that for every X amount you do, you will get the All right, this must be consistent in order to be effective. So the answer here is punishment. If you are going to use punishment to try to get behaviors to occur less often, you need to do it every time they do that unwanted behavior. And you also must do it very quickly after they do the unwanted behavior. It doesn't help to do it, you know, hours later. Not the conditioned response in Pavlov studies. CR would also be the uh, UCR, right? Which in the case of the dogs was drooling or salivating. Okay, so now we're into potpourri where everything's just kind of mixed up. So the most widely used stimulant in the world. Some of you may be consuming it as we speak. Caffeine, right? So if you're drinking coffee, the latte, uh, Coke, Coke Zero, right? You are consuming caffeine. A physical condition where people gasp for air and awaken. This is sleep apnea. you because anytime you don't have oxygen to your brain, it's bad, right? Even if it's for the short amount of time. All right, reinforcers that fulfill basic biological needs. The answer to that one's primary reinforcers. I hit enter in the wrong box here. All right, only a couple left here. Messages presented so quickly, people don't know they've seen them. This is subliminal messages. And we saw how there have been some good experiments, but there've also been some where they've just made up their data. So when a learned response is also shown for similar stimuli. So if we think of little Albert, how he was afraid of the rat, but that also meant he was afraid of the bunny and the fur coat and the dog, and as anyone would be, locks it in that freaky bunny mask. This process is called generalization. All right, so our final Jeopardy question is name the four main types of consequences for behavior in operant conditioning. So we just went over these. And I'll give you a little bit longer since there's four things to write down if you're writing them down for yourselves.
So these are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. All right. And that is it for today. Um, I'll do my thing where I stick around in case anybody has questions. I have my notes, so I'll make sure the chapter four quiz is in the right place. And um, I will uh, make sure I get the Sona instructions on Blackboard for y'all as well.